A couple of kind of profound things jumped out at me as I was thinking about the scripture reading for today. The first is the way that Jesus and those very first disciples connected. And the second thing is that this scripture represents a real passing of the torch from John the Baptist to Jesus. John has had his day, and now it's time for Jesus to take over. In the story, as, as you heard Greg read, a couple of the followers of John the Baptist are with him when Jesus happens to pass by. And John lets them know that Jesus is the one he's been talking about. And they hear that. And they immediately leave John and start following Jesus. Quite literally, they started following Jesus because he noticed, he looked over his shoulder and saw these people following him, and he asks them, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? That's not a difficult question normally, but in this context. These two men have just left their leader, their teacher, and now they start to follow a different leader, a different teacher. What are you looking for? And apparently they didn't know quite what to say because truth be told, they didn't really know what they were looking for. And the same can be said for most of us. We don't know what we're really looking for in life. We just sort of take it one day at a time and do our best to keep up with everything that comes our way, right? Well, these two disciples didn't really know how to answer that question either, so they came up with an answer that really isn't an answer. What are you looking for? Rabbi, where are you staying? And then Jesus answers them, think about this. Come and see. I think this question and answer are much richer than we might imagine. In this instance, the come and see meant that these two men were about to begin a brand new adventure. This is how almost every good story begins. Come and see, leave behind whatever you have to leave behind. These two left John behind. There's always something that has to be abandoned when we take off on a new journey. Come, leave your nets and your boat behind. Leave your counting table and ledgers. Leave goods and kindred. Leave home. Leave friends and foes. Leave work. Leave school. Leave retirement. Leave your old ideas, ideologies, and ignorance. Leave even your old self behind because you can't take any of it with you. And you probably won't need it when you get to wherever you are being summoned. Come and see is almost every storyteller's plea. Because until you come into the world of their story, there's nothing to see. So you have to abandon your accustomed world of computers and coffee cups and slip into that enchanted forest where anything can happen if you just have the eyes to see it. Come and see invites us to an alternative world, a place where we have never been. We find, I think, in this particular exchange, a key to understanding faith. Faith is not so much a matter of thinking as doing. And not doing so much as being and witnessing. Just come and see. And we might realize that Jesus came to make us both more holy and more human. Just come and see. And we might comprehend the life and ministry of Jesus as the very center of our faith. Could this story be telling us something the disciples don't even know yet themselves? What most people are looking for is not information. It's not answers to questions such as, who is Jesus, or is this the one? What we are all looking for without even knowing it is a place to call home, a place to stay, a place to remain always, a way of living that becomes our home, 
And for most of us, Jesus is a huge part of that place, a person who is himself a home, a place to belong, a whole way of life. Jesus knows that what the disciples really want is a place to belong. Whatever he sees on the faces of these two men panting in front of him after running down the road, whatever he sees, what he says to them is just right and wonderfully inviting. Come and see. And they go with him. They end up staying, right? And his story becomes their story. His way of life becomes their way of life. His home becomes their home. What are you looking for, says Jesus to people who were told by someone else where he could be found. Come and see, he said to the people who wondered if they had a place in his story. The thing that moves people from one question to another, from what are you looking for to come and see, that's the story that the church is called to tell. It's the only story the church has to tell. The story of its home, the place from which we draw hope and strength and power. The place is a person. And the best way to tell his story, perhaps the only way, is with our lives. I said there are two things that I found profound. The other is, this is a story of passing the torch from one person to the next, from John the Baptist to Jesus. But then what happens to that torch when Jesus tries to hand it over to the next person and the next people and the next? Who are these people? Are we these people? This weekend, as you probably know, among other things, we are remembering and celebrating the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Much of what Dr. King said and did was firmly planted in biblical principles and the teachings of Jesus. His commitment to nonviolence was in a large part a Jesus thing. His calls for justice and equality were echoes not only of Jesus' connection and advocacy for the poor, but also those great prophetic voices within the Hebrew scriptures. We don't often think about Jesus passing on the torch to others, but just as he had to prepare his own disciples for the time when he would not be walking beside them in the flesh, those same teachings apply to us as well. He's passing a torch to us. And across human history, every once in a while, we can see folks who have taken up the torch of the principles of Jesus. Dr. King was just one in a long line of brave voices who come along and challenge the status quo by trying to actually apply the teachings of Jesus to real life. Imagine that. We're not just a set of beliefs, but we're to live out the teachings. How we treat our neighbor really matters, especially when our neighbor is struggling in a game where the deck is stacked against them. The system, his systemic racism that Dr. King confronted and challenged had been around for a very long time, and truth be told, it is still around. But we are in a unique moment in history because we are witnessing someone rise up who I believe has taken the torch from Dr. King and is attempting to continue his work. This is a name you've heard before. Reverend William Barber II was four years old when Dr. King visited the Mississippi Delta and saw a teacher divide up one apple while trying to feed eight children. The hunger and the misery that Dr. King witnessed inspired the 1968 Poor People's March on Washington. It's a different march. They had a caravan of more than a dozen covered wagons, covered wagons with slogans written on them, feed the poor. And they traveled from Marks, Mississippi to Washington, D.C. to the nation's capital. And there they lived for six weeks of protest. Reverend Barber has nurtured the seed that Dr. King sowed. He is the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And that organization plans its own march on Washington this year on June 20th. Like, like Dr. King, Barber, who is a pastor, pastor of the Greenleaf Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, 
in Goldsboro, North Carolina. He is known for his compelling oratory. Some of us had the first-hand experience of going down to Seattle and hearing him preach. He has a decorated civil rights record and an inclusive vision for humanity. He said, prophets believe that what they proclaim on any day can be transformed into real action. John the Baptist confronted the system of his day with a call to repentance. Jesus confronted the system of his day by teaching a new way of relating to each other, a way of love. It was a way of seeing others in the same light as we see ourselves. It was a way of sacrificial servanthood in a society where the master was the only person that mattered. And along comes Jesus and says, if you are to truly be great, you must serve, you must serve others. That torch, those teachings were passed on to the early followers and an early church where that radical love and support was practiced and people lived for one another and held their goods in common so that all would have enough. And that torch continues to be passed from one to another until we realize that that torch is in our hands and the world looks at us to see what we're going to do with it. Amen.